Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you for listening. We are glad to have you aboard. We love getting listener mail, and we <laughs> you just love getting gifts. Uh, well, you, and you brought got it up, some. and please send more, people. <laughs> honey, uh, garden seeds. You know, I read um, that Tupelo honey is really in trouble this year for weather reasons. Tupelo, the home of one Elvis Presley. Real? I didn't even know. He was that. born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Oh, okay. Um, and hams. Chip. Of the Chesapeake. He wrote you and said, I'm very glad you enjoyed the ham. Did you get the note that included the recipes for Brunswick stew and sweet potato biscuits? All I can say, Chip, is that you made my Easter and keep them coming, honey. Yeah, and I didn't, I don't know what it tasted I, like. You're not, that's, you know, they, they didn't, little, he didn't send it to you. Could have brought me a little sandwich. I, well, you know, next time. <laughs> um, I, I, it, Thank you, Chip. Yeah, sincerely. Um, it was a really fun discussion with Jefferson about books. It, talking about books, with it's like falling off a lot. You know, if you go through Jefferson's correspondence, uh-huh. I mean, there are probably 20 times when he makes lists of books for people. It's like, if you want Jefferson oh, to— Oh, I would have expected it was more. To go right at it. You know, yeah. just say, oh, Mr. Jefferson, I'm uh, not a wealthy man, but I am I would really like to undertake a course of reading. Do you think you might have time to maybe make a few hints? And Jefferson goes right to his table, and he writes out this brilliant catalog. You must have this. And he calculates the cost of each book and says, I know this is a little more than you intended to spend, but believe me, you'll be glad you did. Then he says, read in this order, and you must do this, and you must do that. He's never happier than when he can recommend a course of reading to somebody else. And this all comes from a letter written to us by Ben Wheeler, who several a week ago wrote to us and wanted, I guess, a list of children's yeah, books. Yes, so th- there really weren't children's books in this, you know, let me put it this way. We live in the great age of children's books. If you go to even a like a Barnes & Noble bookstore, you will find acres of intelligent, well-written, age-appropriate, uh, award-winning books for young people. This is amazing. And, of course, it comes at a time when reading is is diminishing fast. In Jefferson's time, there were children's books. There were primers and so on. But for the most part, you graduated quickly into adult literature and people were able to do it. You know, it's one of the most astonishing things that I read about when I study biography is that such and such a person went to Oxford at the age of 12. And you think, what? At 12? They're at Oxford studying Greek? or Hebrew, or astronomy, but it's true that they were hothousing children in that era, and children were expected to be miniature adults and to behave like adults. And so that's a whole different world. Childhood is a kind of a post-industrial or an industrial urban invention, and we Americans love a prolonged childhood. In Jefferson's time, if you were living in New England, you were out slopping hogs. <laughs> well, prompted by this letter, I did a little research. Okay, sir. Trying to find out about children's literature. Okay. And most everything that did exist um, in America during Jefferson's time would have come from England. British lit, yes. It, it is said that in the 1820s, uh, children's literature became sort of became its own thing. It was starting and, to and, grow and after grew Jefferson's time, really. Looking at Jefferson, there were a couple of fiction books that you talked about that he would recommend. Three, I think it was. Uh, yeah, so Robinson Crusoe, absolute essential reading, and it could be read. It could be read by a ten-year-old. You know, there might be a few hard terms, but it's it's not complex, and it's a great adventure story. Don Quixote. And Jefferson, I think, once said that it was one of the few books he ever read more than once. He read it in Spanish, learned Spanish in order to read it. Not necessary. There are brilliant translations of Don Quixote, and there are abridged versions. So, you know, a young person might not want to read all 600 pages of the first um, Don Quixote. That turned out to be a sequel, too. But a a good abridged edition of uh, 150 or 200 pages will give you the highlights of of Quixote and it's a it's a universal story. Uh, uh, th- this is the one that I came across that I found so fascinating because if you do a search of uh, you know of Jefferson's correspondence this book comes up over and over and over again. And the third is Gulliver's Travels which you know in our time um, it's read in English literature courses, but but it's also read by children, but it's always read by children in a very heavily redacted version because 
the 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 two it's four books and the first one is the voyage to to Lilliput where the people are puny and Gulliver is a giant and the second voyage is to the Brobdingnagians where Gulliver is a pygmy and they're giants the third book is to this kind of wacky scientific academy that's filled with the most bizarre over reasoning and and and, uh, and and lack of pragmatic grounding it's actually a magnificent book it talks about projectors these people these kind of visionaries who, who you know can't balance a checkbook or or put food on the table and jefferson in a certain way kind of qualifies as an american projector and then in well, that one's quite abstract and not for children and then in book 4 it's the the yahoos and the winnems the winnems are these rational horses and the yahoos are these um these primates and it's very nasty. It's all excremental, and there's some kind of veiled sexuality and incest, and it's it's not for children. And so, a children's version of Gulliver's Travels is is a is a digest of the first two books, and then nothing from book three and book four. But but for adults, you cannot do better. I I read Gulliver's Travels at least once a year. And I'm always just completely blown away by its greatness. I may have to put that back on my uh, list. Do. Um, but if I can s- step back just a minute again to Don Quixote, there's a whole bunch of letters between Jefferson and Mary Jefferson um, in April and May of 1790. That's with uh, his daughter Maria. Uh, how many pages a day do you read in Don Quixote? Uh, how far are you advancing in him? She writes back, I have not been able to read every day as I've been traveling ever since I saw you last. He writes back, um, uh, your last told me you were not doing, what, what, that what you were not doing, that you were not reading Don Quixote. I hope your next will tell me what you are doing. He's hothousing his own daughters. And then it's, as she writes back, I read every day to my aunt and say my grammar in Spanish. Well, so he's wanting her to read Don Quixote in Spanish. Uh-huh. Oh. I thought that was pretty interesting. What a tyrant. And then April 18th, 1791, I have finished Don Quixote. Poor thing. Um, you know, my daughter. Well, I, she's looking for her dad's approval. My daughter's thing. 24, and now she says to me, Well, surely you've read X. Yeah. You know, and I thought, Wow. <laughs> the, the old whirly gig of time. We got a. I got a gift uh, from one Stuart Webb of England. Came across the ocean. A book, 1776, a London Chronicle, or how oh, yeah. to right. convert Last oneself week, yeah. while losing an empire. It's a beautiful book, and I do actually believe that begging for gifts pays off. But here's my point. He says in the in this beautiful handwritten letter, you guys sometimes. Oh, sorry. Kind of lose track. Time to of, go to the show. No, but <laughs> I want to tell you this story because it's right oh, no. up his. No, you got to hear it. It's right up his alley. So Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. So Don Quixote is the tall, uh, emaciated idealist, and Sancho Panza is the pragmatist who's kind of you know constantly warning Don Quixote. So it's like a universal paradigm, and we see it all over the place. Jefferson and Madison, in some ways, are these, or Jefferson and Adams. But remember, Quick Draw McGraw, when you're a child. And Quick Draw McGraw was a dog who was a sheriff in the Southwest, and he had a Hispanic um, deputy right. named um, Baba Louie. Remember this? Yes, I and do. So, and like, Quick Draw would always like there'd be a nest of thieves all with with guns, and Quick Draw would want to go right in and arrest them. And then Baba Louie would say, I don't think that's such a good idea. And then Quick Draw would say, I'll do the thinning around here, Baba Louie, and don't you forget it. And then Quick Draw would go in and he'd get the living daylights beaten out of him. And then Baba Louie would patch him back together. And this was, this was Don Quixote in cartoon form for children. And the way that the Quick Draw won the battles was he was a singing cowboy. He had a guitar. And when he finally dispatched the Black Bart character, he'd hit him over the head with his guitar, and he'd say, "El Cabong." Uh-huh. Remember this? Uh-huh. This is this is the Don Quixote of our childhood. It exists in many forms. Is my point? Don't cut that because I want Stuart to say, "I told you so." Cut out the digressions. I think I like Poncho and Lefty better, but anyway, I'll do the thinning around here, Baba Louie. Got it. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. Come on it. the cultural tours, France, France, Go to jeffersonhour.com. We really appreciate your support. Any way you can give it to us, and we've gone on long enough. So More here, gifts too, please. Here's the show. Thank you. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. 
your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is President Thomas Jefferson, and good to see you, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I have some questions from your many listeners. I'm going to begin with one uh, that I suppose will take a bit of time to answer. A subject that you always enjoy talking about, I feel fairly confident in saying that, and that is books, sir. I cannot live without books. My father, Peter, was uh, a self-made man. He did not have a formal education. Uh, But he was a great lover of knowledge, and he sacrificed to acquire a a substantial library of about 40 volumes. Well, that's where the question begins, sir. It's from a Mr. Ben Wheeler. He writes, Mr. Jefferson, I understand that reading was an important part of your young life and that your father, Peter, had built a modest family library of about 40 volumes. I am curious, are there any records as to what those 40 volumes were? And how they were selected? There, there's some evidence for this. Uh, there's, no, there's not a, 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 a precise and formal catalog, but these were the books that uh, an English reading gentleman uh, or person of, of curiosity would consult. And so, for example, uh, there would be a, a fairly large um, collection of English literature: so Chaucer, Shakespeare. Ben Jonson, uh, Alexander Pope, uh, John Dryden, um, that whole world of English literature from Beowulf, uh, which is a, a medieval uh, poem, all the way up to the present time, which would be Alexander Pope and and uh, uh, Jonathan Swift and, and so on. And so that would be part of it. Then there would be basic works of history, uh, and politics, uh, so uh, uh, sort of a, a, a bit of nonfiction that would go along with this. Uh, but there were essays, there were learned essays in the English-speaking world of the time. Um, Addison and Steele uh, had produced some of the most um, exquisite English prose of the 18th century, and 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 their their essays were seen as sort of a a primer of how a gentleman should behave and, and what sense of uh, emotional detachment he should have, his, his, his cosmopolitanism and his, his sense of bemusement, his, his steady character, his civility. And so we were taking a lot of our um, formation of character from uh, The Spectator and from Addison and Steele. And, and Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson, the, the great lexicographer uh, who published the Dictionary of the English Language in 1755, was also uh, a serious essayist, not not one to my great admiration. I think he's a he's a fairly dictatorial figure in English literature. But he wrote the Rambler, and the Idler, and the Adventurer, a series of of essays about conduct and 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 moral life, and and they were essential reading for any young person in our time. You mentioned history, sir. I'm I'm wondering was that. Ancient history and ancient history alone, or was there some contemporary for your time history? Well, not much. My father uh, died when I was 14, so he died well before the American Revolution. And there were very few colonial histories uh, that were available up to that time. But but there were histories of Great Britain and histories of the world, and particularly ancient. So we were interested in British history. British history is the story of uh, of the Anglo-Saxon peoples coming um, across the English Channel and establishing uh, a kind of a democratic uh, or at least a proto-democratic culture in Britain. Then they were overwhelmed by the Norman Conquest in 1066, and that changed everything and, and, and in many respects nearly extinguished the, the flame of liberty. And subsequent British history is the reclamation of the ancient rights and liberties of the Anglo-Saxon people against the Norman yoke. And so this was essential reading for anybody who was interested in the American experiment or, or, the, or the, the way Britain had evolved into the nation that it was at the time of my father's young manhood. And so we read all of that. But, but for the most part, the history that we concentrated on was the history of Republican Rome – 
That would be Rome from 509 BC until uh, about 30 AD, and also uh, Greece, uh, Athens particularly, in the time of uh, Pericles and Aristotle and Plato. Mr. Wheeler continues uh, asking about uh, the Shadwell fire. We know that your boyhood home was was destroyed by fire. Um, he wonders if any of those volumes survived that fire. Yes, unfortunately, my boyhood home, Shadwell, burned completely in February 1770, and with it, almost all of my personal effects, including uh, papers and books. Uh, fires were a terrible problem this time. First of all, we were leading profoundly rural lives, so there were no uh, fire departments and or, or cooperatives which could put out a fire. And we were cooking with open fires. That's why kitchens were often detached from the main dwelling because if they burned down, then at least the house uh, would survive. So and we had candles and fireplaces. So there was much more open flame in my time than there would be in your time. And so fire was a very significant issue. Uh, and Shadwell burned down. And when it burned down, it took everything. And in a certain sense, I'm I'm glad for that because it forced me to design my own home, which became Monticello. It also you know, it represented a break from my youth into my manhood. There are probably papers that I would have wanted to preserve, but a lot of what was lost was juvenilia, uh, early correspondence, things that might have seemed primitive or even an embarrassment to me in, in, in my older Age, but I'll tell you one thing that happened. The, you know, historians say that the the Shadwell fire was a fortunate accident because after that, I I gained a, a kind of obsession with with keeping copies. So I thought, what if the, what if there's another fire, and, and this time it might be at a time when I'm performing as the governor of Virginia or the secretary of state or even the president. And so I I began to make copies of everything that I wrote, so that in the event of a fire. Uh, some of those records would be saved. And, and so historians are very pleased with this because, you know, if you send a letter to John Adams or send a letter to um, Thaddeus Kosciuszko, the Polish patriot, there's no um, guarantee that those letters will ever come back and be gathered into uh, a systematic correspondence. But if you keep all the letters you receive – but also make copies of all the letters that you send, as I did uh, beginning after the Shadwell fire, then you have a complete record of, of your correspondence, and correspondence was our essential way of communicating. Again, we're reading a letter from Mr. Ben Wheeler, and he continues with this, sir, which might require a little bit of introspective thought on your part. He, he writes, since you were reading those books at such an impressionable age in your youth, do you feel they were more impactful and formative in the development of your worldview than books you would read later in life? Of course. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in John Locke's epistemology, by which I mean that when you're born, you're born with a blank slate. Uh, in Latin, the tabula rasa, which literally means a blank or erased slate. You're born with with nothing. There are no preconceived ideas. There are no deep platonic notions that come uh, with your birth. You're born empty. And so you become the sum total of the things that are written onto the, the slate. This is family, uh, what you observe, uh, sensory perceptions, the books that you read, the conversations that you have, uh, all the things that, that you experience – lay down onto this slate uh, a personality, a, 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 a completely formed human being. Now, the best of us try to maintain some blank space on the slate through life so that we can change our minds and, and learn new things and, and continue to, to develop. Uh, but at any rate, you become sort of the sum total. So if you're born in, in New England, you're likely to be a Calvinist, uh, not because you may intrinsically – have a Calvinist soul, but because that's the that's the system, the doctrinal and religious system that has been uh, presented to you. And if you're born in Virginia, you're less likely to be a Calvinist and more likely to be an Anglican or an Episcopalian. If you're from New England, uh, you're more likely to be thrifty 
uh, partly because of the environment, that the, the soils there are not rich. And, and this comes from, a, from the sort of the social aspect of the Calvinist spirit. If you're from Virginia, you're more likely to be uh, more sensuous, more uh, comfortable, less concerned, uh, uh, more opulent, more wasteful. Just because you're a Virginian, sir? Yes. I think environment plays a very significant role. So back to, to this gentleman's question, the books you read as a young individual – uh, are going to help to create the matrix of your adult personality, and and they you read them at a time when your mind is very strong. You know your judgment is not yet completely formed, but your memory and your and and your, your sheer capacity, your your ration your rationality, your 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 ability to use your brain to process information, they're at their maximum. Well, then it would follow, sir, that what young people read is quite important. Yes, of of course, and and if for example, later in life, when I was helping to design the University of Virginia, I was choosing the books, and one of the joys of of my life was was selecting lists of books for people to read. I I did many of these in the course of my life, and I wanted to create an ideal Republican curriculum. Well, David Hume's massive multi-volume History of England was one maybe the best history of England. But it was a Tory history. It was a it was a high toned, monarchical, aristocratic Tory history of Britain, and I didn't want the students at the University of Virginia to to learn their British history through this uh, corrupted lens. And so, I did two things. I looked for a, a more Republican, a more Whig centered history of Britain, but also I encouraged a, a, a redaction of of Hume, a kind of a. a an edited version of him that took out some of the worst of his Tory excesses and just kept to the, the narrative history of Britain because I felt that if these young scholars at the University of Virginia were reading Hume without proper um, preparation, they might imbibe the, the wrong-headed principles of federalism and Toryism. Mr. Jefferson, we need to take a short break, but we'll return to this conversation about books in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. In between segments, Clay, I wanted to give you the opportunity to tell people about the upcoming John Wesley Powell Symposium to be held in Vail. I am excited about this on Monday, June 17th, 2019, in Vail, Colorado, one of the most beautiful places on earth. I will be performing as the one-armed Civil War hero and explorer, John Wesley Powell, who is who famously explored the Colorado River and its canyons in 1869. Now, this begins at 5 p.m. at the famous Saddle Ridge restaurant with a cocktail hour, a, a sort of a social hour, and then your program begins at 6. I'll be performing as Powell. The hard part of this one is having to cut off my right arm, <laughs> uh, but I do it because I believe in the humanities. But Saddle Ridge Restaurant in Beaver Creek is a very important place, and it has one of the largest private collections of American Western artifacts and art. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to Vail, Colorado in the summer. Its location is really distinctive too. June right? 17th, 2019, Saddle Ridge in Vail, or actually Beaver Creek nearby, John Wesley Powell, who wrote about how we should rethink Jefferson beyond the 100th meridian. For more information, go to jeffersonhour.com and click on events. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. This week, Mr. Jefferson is kind enough to talk to us about books, and particularly we started with that collection of, of 40 volumes that your father, Peter, owned, and we're answering questions from a, a listener, Mr. Ben Wheeler. He writes, Now, sir, in my time, we are fortunate to have access to seemingly endless books, and many are written especially for young readers. Were there any books during your time that were written for children or adolescents, or were books limited enough that children were relegated to reading the same volumes as adults? Well, I slightly dispute the last clause of, of his question. Uh, it's not that we, the children were relegated to reading adult books. It's, it's that they had the opportunity to read adult books. You have a, a vast and, 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 by the way, very distinguished children's literature in your time. We did not. There were a few children's books, but... So it's a difference of perspective. We don't understand how 
unique and special uh, books were to children during now we take it for granted. The average Virginia household had two or fewer books, you know, a Bible and a Shakespeare perhaps, maybe neither. Um, more likely to have a Bible than a Shakespeare. But beyond that, there there wasn't really book culture. There were some newspapers and the beginnings of what you call magazines. Uh, but it was a time of where print matter was very rare, expensive, and hard to get, particularly in the outback uh, where I lived in, in, in rural Virginia. So most people didn't have access to books. It was a much more oral culture, uh, storytelling, jokes, jests, music, uh, conversation, uh, those things, preaching, those things were much more central to human discourse at the beginning of my life than they were at the end and, and vastly more central to, to the discourse of, of my life than they would be in, in your time. So there were fewer books. Uh, there, it was hard to get these books, and, and, and there was not a particular children's literature in this era. So I remember... So my father had this library of around 40 volumes. I've given you a sense of, of, of what was in it. I started reading at about the age of four, and I moved almost immediately into uh, what you would call adult books. Who, who would have taught you to read, sir? Almost certainly I taught myself. You must have been aided by your mother or father somewhat. My mother, uh, my father would not have had the time for this. He was often on the road. He was a, a, a surveyor and a map maker and a, a diplomat. And spent a lot of time on the frontiers of Western Virginia, and uh, I, so I wasn't home that often. I started school at about five, you know, going to um, neighborhood schools, private schools um, operated by clergymen during the week. And so I learned very early, you know, people in my era, in the Renaissance through my era, would go to university, to say Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard, at the age of 13 or even 12. So education started sooner. It was more adult in character. It was more rigorous by far than in your time. So you expected children to grow up fast. We didn't really have a concept of childhood. So a person like myself at the age of, say, 12 would be expected to be a miniature adult. Uh, it's not the kind of prolonged childhood and, and, and indulgence of childhood that characterizes your era. We were expected to conform, to hold ourselves like adults, to gesture like adults, to have a, an, essentially an adult vocabulary, to have adult interests, to read adult books, uh, to participate in adult conversations. At age 12 or younger? Even younger, but certainly by the time we were 12. So childhood, as you understand it, is a luxury of a very wealthy industrial urban culture. Well, I think of your time and you know, primarily uh, farmers. Farmers like large families because they're, uh, it's a built-in labor force. Is that too crass to say? No, certainly not. You know, a farm is a, is a very complicated business and to to raise lambs or to uh, make cheese and have it and, and milk cows and, and to slaughter uh, pigs, to feed all these animals, to grow vegetables for, uh, for the table, to do all the things that have to be done on a self-sufficient farm. I mean, a farm in my time was a sort of miniature civilization that, that it essentially could provide everything that anybody needed on that on that piece of ground. This requires a considerable amount of labor. Now, you know, I come from a, a gentlemanly background, and I come from a, a society of slaves. So it would be different in New England. In New England, the family, or maybe one or two hired servants, would do the labor, the milking, the, the slaughtering, the, the cutting out of a beefsteak, the, the milling of flour, whatever it might be. In Virginia, because of slavery— um, which was, you know, whatever else you want to say about slavery, it was a source of, of ready and inexpensive labor. And so I wrote a letter about this once saying where you can get somebody else to do your work, you're unlikely to do it yourself. This is a deep character flaw in the American South, especially in the, in, in the slave South. And so we, our, children, our children didn't do the same kind of work that they would have done in Pennsylvania or New England. Yes, I must interject, uh, sir, that there are contemporary Americans who have 
much more to say about the enslavement of people. Yes, than I you mean. Yes. Of course. I don't want to I don't want to get lost on that subject. I'm merely at the moment talking about sources of labor. So a, a farm family in Vermont would be almost fundamentally different in its approach to uh, self-sufficiency than a farm family in Maryland or Virginia because we had uh, slaves and slaves performed almost all the labor and a, a young person, a squire, a, the, the daughter or, or the son of a, of a Virginia slave owner would have had a very pampered life would have been expected to learn household management and, and, and other skills, but compared to uh, somebody living in, in, in western New York, uh, it's, it's night and day. I uh, have to go back to this quote uh, you've referenced many times in our conversations. I cannot live without books. I looked that up, and in fact, that came from a letter that you wrote much later in life to John Adams uh, in 1815. And uh, the entire quote reads, I cannot live without books, but fewer will suffice where amusement and not use is the only future object. Yes, I had three libraries, four if you count my father's. So my father's volumes ran to around 40. Then I developed my own first library, some of which burned in the February uh, 1770 fire. Then I developed my second library, which was the large, famous library of about 7,000 volumes. Um, that, that was meant to be a universal library, so astronomy and religious doctrine and the history of navigation and philosophy and literature and science and exploration and geography. And then there was a third library after I sold my library in 1815 to Congress, partly to replace the lost Library of Congress that was burned by the British, but also because I needed the money. And then my third library numbered a, a couple of thousand volumes, and that's where I said to Adams, now that I am elderly and no longer a statesman, I'm just choosing books for pleasure. I don't need any longer to have a huge reference collection the way I did when I was a, an active statesman. And so then it was just math, um, Greek and some Greek, uh, gardening books, books that pleased me in my old age. Uh, I needed those books because I had sold every book that I had to Congress. And so that replacement library was a much more narrowly focused one. And I bring up the entire quote only to reinforce the point that you were a user of books. You were not someone who just wanted to have them to look at and be proud of your collection. You used your books. So we began by talking about my father's library, which included a kind of a basic set of English literature, Chaucer, Dryden, uh, Swift, Pope, Shakespeare, Milton. Uh, I had all those books in all three of my libraries, of course, but... But as I grew older, those books became less important to me. I'm essentially a reader of nonfiction. I believe that the, the purpose of my life and the purpose of my generation was, and I use this quote often, to ameliorate the condition of mankind. As I said to Lafayette, you know, that, that he should go into peasants' homes in, in the rural countryside of France to see what their soup is like, whether their beds are, are comfortable, what, what, the, what their basic needs are, are their needs being met? How could he, as, a, as an important national figure, help to make their lives a little less onerous and a little more comfortable and maybe extend their longevity a little by providing some comforts that, that would not you know, wear down their, their minds and bodies so quickly. And, and so my, my purpose, my mission in life was to ameliorate the condition of mankind. Well, you don't really do that by reading Gulliver's Travels or by reading Paradise Lost. Those are pleasures and they're deep pleasures, but they're not as important as nonfiction, which tells you about how to handle uh, the Hessian fly that was destroying our wheat crop or what, what kind of sheep are, are best suited to uh, North and South Carolina or what the geography of, of the Louisiana Purchase really is so we can begin to plan our extension of the American Republic towards the West. These things are, are extraordinarily important, especially in, in my era of American history and, and imaginative literature, Homer, Virgil, Milton – 
uh, Shakespeare, those things would be much less important to me personally, and I think to our to our culture. Listening to you talk about the pleasure of reading, I, I would suspect, uh, and, and I, may I say, I'm with you, Mr. President. I uh, I prefer nonfiction myself, but there's a pleasure in in learning. Yes, what one wants is information, data. You want to know how high the Rocky Mountains are. We want to know where the source of the Missouri River is. We want to know, if we can, something about the origins of the ingenious Mandan Indians of of the upper um, portion of, of of the Missouri River, the upper Louisiana. We want to know something about the ocean currents and the nature of winds and weather. We want to know things that that are practical and are useful to the human experiment. And so it's information we want. In your time, you have tools that are not related directly to books that can provide information in magnitudes, almost infinitely uh, more uh, profuse and immediate than was available in, in our time. And so you're very fortunate in that regard because that's what we basically want. But... I also am, am very pleased when someone like David Hume um, produces a systematic treatise on something or Adam Smith or, or Gibbon because you want um, an analytical synthetic mind taking a, a mass of data and putting it into a, sh- a narrative shape, into a, a, a systematic form which delivers that, that data – in context and in a in a in a fashion that is digestible, and so so it's not just data we're collecting; it's data as seen through the mind of an extraordinarily organized intellect. Yes, I, I agree, and I, I think a good book is like a good conversation, uh, Mr. Jefferson. I want I want to ask the last question from Mr. Wheeler. I'm anxious and interested to hear your response, sir. He writes, "Many parents in my time read to their children in the evenings before bed." When you were young and before reading age, did your parents read to you? And if so, was this custom passed along? And did you read to your children? I don't recall being read to. I certainly didn't read to my own children and grandchildren. Um, It was expected that they would read and then we would discuss. And we had this thing, this little habit. I don't know if I've ever said this to you, but, but after the main meal of the day at Monticello, which would be Three in the winter, 4 p.m. in the summer would last maybe a couple of hours. Then we would all sort of scatter and, and, and the children would go out and run races or work in the garden or, or, or do whatever it was that they wanted to do. And then there would be tea time. And during tea time, which was sort of a light supper, we would have a – there would be a period after it where we sat around my chair – this would be my children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and whoever happened to be there. And everybody would pick up a book and there would be a period of, say, half an hour of absolute silence. No one could make a peep. Everyone had a book, different books. And then afterwards, there would be a kind of informal seminar. And I would say, well, what, what to a grandchild, say Ellen or Virginia, what, what were you reading? And tell us about it. And, and what, what questions does it raise? And, and why did you choose that book? And so there would be a, this sort of informal reading circle. I thought this was very important because I think it's, A, I, I wanted my grandchildren to, to, to be intelligent and well-read, but, but B, I wanted to create the, the sort of conversation that can only come when there's something actually to talk about, not just gossip and, and, and routine um, patter about the weather. You did uh, recommend magazines as well, sir. The magazine was born in this era. The first magazine was called the Gentleman's Magazine in London. It's the one that Samuel Johnson wrote for before he became the famous lexicographer. And the term, it was a man named Edward Cave who created this. Uh, and he was using a metaphor. In your time, it's a convention to, to say something as a magazine, but in this time, it was a brand new term. And he was saying, just as you you put lead and powder and and rifles in a in a magazine, that's what that's known as. A magazine is sort of the armory. He said a gentleman's armory or a gentleman's toolkit um, is uh, book reviews and learned essays and and scientific queries and so on. So he called that the magazine. In other words, the artillery, the armory of a, of a well-educated person. So the word magazine was born as that metaphor. And now you just say, well, that's a magazine and no one thinks of where it came from. But it actually came from 
the physical storage of, of gunpowder and lead um, in a in there's a magazine in Williamsburg, for example, that you can see if you travel there in your own time, and and this was a kind of a central armory. Your well kept account books um, show that you had access to a number of magazines, including the Analectic Magazine, the Edinburgh Review, uh, Monthly Magazine, Portfolio, the Columbian Magazine, uh, the Repository, the Weekly Magazine of Original Essays, and that you. Uh, recommended these uh, to reading members, probably children, of other people's families. Well, yes, because a newspaper reports the tariff issue in Congress, or you know, do we or do we not ratify the Louisiana Treaty, and you know, what is Hamilton up to now? Uh, that's ephemeral. Uh, a newspaper has to be published very quickly. Uh, there's no chance for pulling back and, and providing a deeper context. The space is always limited. And so between a newspaper and a book was the magazine. And a magazine is a lovely thing because it, it, it maybe has five or six book reviews. I probably can't read all of those books, but I want to know something about what's in them. And so these book reviews then are digests of the essential argument of those books and maybe some quotations. I might on the basis of those book reviews decide I need that book and, and to try to obtain it. And then there are essays on gardening and there are columnists and there is a political discourse and there is an analysis of, of economic conditions or overseas trade or, or recent developments in, in shipmaking. And so all of those miscellaneous things had no life outside of this 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 gathered up uh, set of pages, they become a magazine, and this allows someone to have a, a diversion, to learn a great deal in a short compass. So yes, the magazine is, in my opinion, one of the great inventions of humankind, and it dates to the late 16th uh, and the 17th centuries in Great Britain. One fiction book that I know you recommended and throughout your life was Don Quixote. There are three books in this way, Don Quixote by Cervantes, uh, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe, Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. And what, what, what makes these similar is that they're all capable of being read by a seven-year-old with great pleasure, but a 70-year-old can read them with infinitely more pleasure, that they hold up, that the, the more mature uh, you bring yourself to the book, the more it delivers, but it is accessible to a, a thoughtful child. Very good, Mr. Jefferson. I thank you for a very pleasant conversation, sir. To all of you, please read. I read 12 to 15 hours a day. I think even half of that would be good for you. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Between segments, Clay, I wanted to give you the opportunity to remind listeners that we have another book club coming up. The Jefferson Hour Book Club. We recently did notes on the state of Virginia, but the next up in the book club is Ron Chernow's masterful biography of Colonel Alexander Hamilton, the vile Hamilton. If you would like to submit a question about this book, we'd love to get it from you, but you need to send it to us by June 27th. By the end of June, and the book is Alexander Hamilton. Ron Chernow has written probably the greatest biography ever of Hamilton, and although it's not very nice to Mr. Jefferson, it's widely regarded as great an book. extraordinary book. Right. Um, so if you want to send a question in, you need to do that again before June 27th and go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Ask, um, or if you want to find out about the upcoming books, go to jeffersonhour.com and click on Book Club. Get started with your reading and send in your comments and questions. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This is Clay Jenkinson, now safely out of character. My wig has been thrown into the into the dairy section of the barn. And uh, sitting across from me is none other than the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. That would be me. And uh, happy to be here and proud to be. It was a great conversation this week. Jefferson never ceases to amaze me. But before we get into talking about that, uh, a piece of mail came to us, actually, while we were taping. Really? Yeah, and it, we, I got I to gotta read it. This comes from Chris Levisi in Cohasset, Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. This is not so much a question, but rather a thank you. Oh, good. Your podcast has inspired me to create an assignment for my AP U.S. students, where they take on the role of Hamilton and, oh. and Jefferson Good. to debate the issues of the day. 
We're just starting the project now, but I wanted to send a tip of the cap your way. Love the show. Chris Luvisi. I'll tell you what. Great? To, to, to Mr. Luvisi, if you're listening, let's work it out. We'll do a thing where your students can submit questions to the Jefferson Hour. Oh, that's always fun. I have we, one, too. May I read it? Please. Uh, so you know how I beg for stuff? Occasionally ask for things. But I just received today, you, you handed it to me, from one Stuart Webb of England by Foreign Post. A copy of a thick, wonderful-looking book called 1776, A London Chronicle, How to Divert Oneself While Losing an Empire. And it's a series of letters, diary entries, and oh, so on. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Following 1776 month by month. Um, it was uh, produced, edited by a man named Justin Leville. But Stuart Webb um, sent this beautiful letter, and it, it's, it's like calligraphy. And I, I just want to give you a couple of little pieces from sure. it. Sure. Uh, he says, the, the program remains essential listening and an important part of my life. I continue to find it interesting, informative, and entertaining. I come to the program from a general interest in history and a time I was looking to broaden my horizon. I find myself some four years later with a keen interest in the revolutionary period and the Enlightenment. And then he goes on to say uh, that uh, he wishes us to continue doing this, and he wants to send this book as a small token of uh, his gratitude, which I greatly appreciate. And then there are a couple of afternotes. Please keep the podcast introduction. It sets the show up well and is often the most relaxed part of the program. I mentioned this latter point is a major strength of the show uh, is the chemistry between Clay and David and the warmth of your friendship. And then he's, but then he says, and please maintain the Jefferson watch given the fractured state of politics in both the UK and US. I value this oasis of calm reasons opinion. And then he asks one last piece, but it can't all be good. And he says, I like your informal uh, approach, but I remember that sometimes you go a little off topic I recall Clay talking of his ham radio days and David trying to broaden Clay's appreciation of Bob Dylan. I realize that the program has a specific remit, but I wonder if more free-ranging conversations would be considered as premium items on the 1776 Club. I think I think we get that. What noted, a great letter. Noted. And, and, 1776, and a London Chronicle or How to Divert Oneself. You know what I think? If you beg for gifts, you often get them. This one came across the Atlantic Ocean, and now I have it in my hand. Yeah, it send gifts you get mentioned. If you send a ranch <laughs> dinner with us here in North Dakota, uh, pay no attention to that man in the corner. Um, but uh, it is very nice to get those oh, things, so and lovely. it looks like a fascinating book. I hope we'll have a chance to. Talk I'll lend about it, it to you in a, in a year's time. And you know, uh, criticisms we we want to hear from people. You know, um, the ongoing one in the past mm, month, six weeks is. Would you please get off current politics? And also, we really like to hear the perspective on current politics. So I'm, I'm backing it away a little, and I'll tell you why. Because I don't think, you know, I'd never heard this term before, the 2016 election. The things are, quote, baked in. But I do think they are. And I think that we're at a time when people just talk over each other. And there's no real discourse. Jefferson is the root of the program, always has been, always will be. But I also... I enjoy hearing Jefferson's perspective, be it from he or you, um, on on how things are working out. I appreciate that, and I like that, and I and I think our conversations do get at some important some important constitutional and Jeffersonian points. But but let me go back to the theme of this program: books. So this wonderful letter talking about the forty books in Jefferson's father's library, and then Jefferson's love affair with books, and then. You and I got into this conversation when we first got the the letter. Could I produce a list of 40 books that I think everyone should read? Can, can we promise at some point that we'll post yes. this? Yes, and so but I started. And then I thought, wow, this is harder than you think because if I had if you said to me, what are 40 books that every Jeffersonian should read? Any Plutarch? There's some Plutarch there. There's Any Tacitus? Some, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, Montesquieu, The Federalist Papers. You, you can get to 40 pretty quickly. So that's Every Jeffersonian. But if someone said to me, Mr. Jenkinson, if you yourself, forget Jefferson, were recommending 40 books, what would they be? Well, that's a whole different yeah. discourse yeah. and hard because then you start to second guess yourself and think, well, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, okay. And then Thoreau's Walden, okay. And suddenly you're at 180 books. 
it, I'm going to do it. I think it's really important. So yeah, I'm, I'm great. pledging to produce 40 books that every Jeffersonian should read, and then 40 books that I, uh, the Jefferson pretender, with or without respect to Jefferson, think that are worth reading. And then I will give an award to anyone who actually reads them. <laughs> um, we, we're almost time for, it's almost time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Um, and uh, there's a couple of questions I wanted to sneak in quickly. Um, one came from Wade Beisner, um, and it is the full quote that we used a couple of weeks ago. Democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote, and he attributes that to Benjamin Franklin. Yes, certainly not Jefferson. Yeah, but you remember we had that, and I yes. thought that was really cute. You know, it's amazing. We've done shows on this, uh, quotations attributed to great figures that are not actually theirs. Mm-hmm. Monticello maintains a list. Other people have made these lists. The, the number one person for whom words are put into his historic mouth is Abraham Lincoln. And then one last one, if we can do this quickly, um, comes from Don Armentrout. Um, I recently heard that the only reason he calls him Teddy, I will not. The only reason Theodore Roosevelt is represented at Mount Rushmore is because he was a friend of Gutzon Borglum. No, that's not true. But but he was a friend of, of Borglum. Uh, and he had a, uh, Borglum has a famous Lincoln about the size of a garbage can. It's not a very felicitous metaphor, but but it's about that size. And it was it was displayed in the White House um, for a period during the Roosevelt administration. But Borglum, it's a long and interesting story. I know we don't have time, but we was thinking, well, who do you have to have on Mount Rushmore? And he has Washington, of course, Jefferson, of course, who purchased South Dakota. Uh, Lincoln, inevitably, and then, well, who's now, then what? And so the fourth had to be someone who was of great national um, stature, but it was a little too soon for Roosevelt. You know, this is the 19, late 20s and early 30s. Roosevelt's only been dead for 11 years or so. There's a sense maybe we better wait to see how history sifts this out. But Roosevelt was inevitable in the end because he's our first Western uh, president. He's our first cowboy president, and he's the only one who ever stepped foot in the state of South Dakota. And so, and so shame on anyone who thinks that this was merely friendship. With that, sir, it is now time for this week's Jefferson Watch. I know this program is about the third president, Thomas Jefferson, but today I want to take a moment to lament the passing of one of the finest scholar biographers of our time, Edmund Morris. The great biographer of Ronald Reagan and Theodore Roosevelt died on May 24th. He was 78 years old. Edmund Morris was born in Kenya on May 27, 1940, to South African parents. He moved to Britain in 1964. Without a college degree and no training in historiography, he began his career as a biographer in the 1970s in New York. His biography of Roosevelt was intended to be contained in a single volume, but T.R. proved to be too big for such narrow confines. Morris eventually produced a 2,500-word trilogy. Volume 1, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, is regarded as one of the finest biographies of the 20th century. Published in 1979, it won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. I remember reading it in the 1980s in North Dakota. It takes Roosevelt from his birth in New York City in 1858 to the moment when he came into the presidency through the back door following the assassination of William McKinley in September 1901. I can actually remember some of the locations where I read that book and conversations I had about it with my friend Steve Henricks. Much of that volume is about Roosevelt's four-year sojourn in the North Dakota Badlands between 1883 and 1887, where he invested in two ranches, helped to create a locally governed grazing association, hunted big game animals, played cowboy and sheriff's deputy, grieved the simultaneous deaths of his wife and mother on Valentine's Day, 1884, and indeed healed his broken spirit. As a North Dakotan, a citizen of a backwater state least and last visited a blank spot in the nation's consciousness, I remember feeling deep state pride in reading this magisterial account of T.R.'s rite of passage in the Dakota Badlands that I loved and love. I remember feeling a sense of awe 
that this man Edmund Morris, I knew nothing about him at the time, had written such a magnificent book. There is no scholar, no biographer, no historian who would not have wished to have written The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Eventually, Morris produced two more volumes on Roosevelt. Theodore Rex was published in 2001, and the final volume of the trilogy, Colonel Roosevelt, came out in 2010. Volumes two and three were not as powerful and masterful as the rise of Theodore Roosevelt, but they were still great, and all three are must-reading for anybody who wishes to come to terms with the hectic, brilliant, boisterous, heroic, and deeply charismatic Roosevelt. Unfortunately, Morris interrupted his work on Roosevelt to write a thick one-volume biography of another cowboy president, Ronald Reagan. Dutch, a memoir of Ronald Reagan, was published in 1999. In some respects, the Reagan biography shattered Morris's career. The Reagans chose him because Ronald Reagan had a deep admiration for Theodore Roosevelt and because Morris was regarded as one of the best biographers in the English-speaking world. Morris was granted virtually unprecedented access to President Reagan, but when he sat down to write the official biography of one of the more consequential presidents of the 20th century, he came to the conclusion there, there was really no central core to Reagan, that he was boring, that his life outside the presidency was not very interesting, and that if there were a compelling center of Reagan's soul, it was so deeply hidden and protected that he could not write a great biography using traditional methods. At that point, Morris made a fateful decision. He inserted himself into the biography as a fictional character who had known the president from childhood. The result was a book that broke hearts. The Reagan family was hurt, even outraged. Reagan admirers and lovers of presidential biography felt betrayed. Reagan speechwriter Peggy Noonan dismissed Dutch as, quote, a belly flop into the pools of Narcissus. The book was severely criticized by historians and the publishing establishment. Even people who were not offended shook their heads and concluded that a very important opportunity had been lost. As usual, Thomas Jefferson provides a key insight. He wrote, Every human being must be viewed according to what it is good for. For not one of us, no, not one, is perfect, and were we to love none who had imperfection, this world would be a desert for our love. I love that. Morris's greatness far exceeds his biographical degradation of the Gipper. Morris came to North Dakota two times in the last decade of his remarkable life, once when Dickinson State University hosted the annual Theodore Roosevelt Association meeting, but even more interestingly, when the U.S. Forest Service obtained the Eberts Ranch north of Medora directly in the viewshed of the Elkhorn Ranch unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. I played a tiny little part in that event, some of which took place at the Eberts Ranch and another part at the Burning Hills Amphitheater in Medora. Morris was a remarkably elegant and articulate man with a South Africa and British accent, a perfectly cut short beard, a finely tailored suit, just a bit of hauteur, and a slightly dismissive attitude towards American civilization. It was about 120 degrees on that hot July afternoon at the amphitheater, which can be a furnace in mid-afternoon, about 200 people had gathered to celebrate the saving of the Elkhorn Viewshed after years of false starts and political wrangling. Former Governor Ed Schaefer gave a brief speech, and then the great Edmund Morris lectured for perhaps 20 or 25 minutes. I know this will sound a little gushy, but you felt you were in the presence of biographical royalty when Morris spoke. At the end of a finely crafted address, Morris asked for an, an indulgence. He would like to read from the opening of a chapter entitled In Cowboy Land from Roosevelt's 1914 autobiography. I sat forward. That chapter opening, in my opinion, is one of the finest things Roosevelt ever wrote. He wrote 40 books, depending on how you count, all by himself, some of them classics. But this was a special passage even by Roosevelt's standards. Here it is. It was still the Wild West in those days, a land of vast silent spaces of lonely rivers and of plains where the wild game stared at the passing horsemen. We worked under the scorching midsummer sun when the wide plains shimmered and wavered in the heat, and we knew the freezing misery of riding night guard around the cattle in the late fall roundup. In the soft springtime the stars were glorious in our eyes each night before we fell asleep, and in the winter we rode through blinding blizzards when the driven snow dust burnt our faces.' 
There were monotonous days as we guided the trail cattle or beef herds hour after hour at the slowest of walks, and minutes or hours teeming with excitement as we stopped stampedes or swam the herds across rivers treacherous with quicksands or brimmed with running ice. We knew toil and hardship and hunger and thirst, and we saw men die violent deaths as they worked amongst the horses and cattle or fought in evil feuds with one another. But we felt the beat of hearty life in our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. When he finished reading that fabulous passage, Morse looked up at the audience, paused, and said, I wonder if you Yanks will ever produce another president who could write like that. The audience laughed a little hesitatingly and a little nervously, and then stood up to honor the best Roosevelt scholar in the world in Medora, North Dakota, a venue made possible by the civic-mindedness of the Eberts family, the political mastery of North Dakota Senator Byron Dorgan, by the tourist infrastructure made possible by the vision of Harold Schaefer, and, of course, a young New York Assemblyman's decision to become the Theodore Roosevelt of our national memory and mythology in the badlands of the Little Missouri River in western North Dakota. The greatest biographers of our time have been William Manchester, who wrote about Churchill, Robert Caro, the 83-year-old scholar who is still trying to get Lyndon Johnson through Vietnam, and Edmund Morris, whose biography of Roosevelt will be read and studied as long as there is American history. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888 888- 828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of 